I felt like what he said was quite, quite insightful, or revealing to us today. Yes, something that occurred to me when I was reading that, um, I have a granddaughter here in Anson that has a black friend and her friend is a straight A honor student, <laughs> uh, serves on the student council, uh, has aced the star test. And yet when she writes on, um, on her Facebook page, she uses the vernacular uh, sometimes so you wouldn't know how smart she is <laughs> necessarily. Well, you know, uh, it's something uh, Camilla Harris, uh, who will likely soon be vice president, um, highly articulate woman, but whatever else you, you think, one way or the other, she's very articulate, extremely well-educated. And when she's in California or in most situations, she articulates uh, standard English, for lack of a better term. But man, every time she goes down south to campaign, uh, she puts on the most false Southern accent of anyone that I know except my own. Um, and uh, I will say of my Southern accent, I wish I had one. I, I, am, I am a Southerner. I was born in Arkansas, raised for the most part in Tennessee and lived out here in Texas. In Texas, the part of Texas I live in is not Southern, but um, unfortunately, from the time I was two years old, I've had hearing problems. I had an ear infection when I was two years old. The doctors gave me penicillin. I had a reaction to penicillin, which they thought they didn't recognize. They gave me more penicillin. And yes, I cannot take penicillin, I assure you. Uh, but uh, I think that's the reason, in part, that my, my voice is kind of a bland mid Midwestern accent. But uh, I would love to have a cultured Southern accent. It's just one of those things that would go with my persona so well, but I, I just don't do it. I, 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 and, and when I try to do it, it, uh, it just comes off so feather fakey. <laughs> uh, well, it is 2.05 and if you wanna go ahead and get started, is that okay? It's fine. I Yes, I'm ready to start. Okay. Um, I want to welcome everybody to uh, part three, uh, lesson C. I think it is <laughs> losing track. <laughs> um, I, I'll remind you that everybody will be muted except for Fred. If you have a question you don't want to forget and you want to ask it, type it into the chat and we'll get to it in the Q&A. And without further ado, Fred, take it away. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, our lesson today uh, that we'll be sharing together uh, is entitled uh, The War on Water, Blockade Runners, Ironclads, and Commerce Raiders. And uh, it's, it's a portion of the war, to my surprise, people don't know about as much as I would think they did. Uh, it's one of those things where Going all the way back to the when I was 13 years old, and I first became interested in studying the American Civil War, um, my my interest in the Civil War has largely been as a as a hobbyist, as as uh, someone who just found it fascinating, and it did lead to my eventual choice of being a historian in my career, though the kind of historian I was was not the historian of the American South or the Civil War except by circumstance. And what I mean by circumstance is that my chosen area of interest and discipline is American social and intellectual history. But then as events occurred, as I found topics to write on, uh, it turned out to be events dealing primarily with the American South, but in many cases, how the American South interpreted the Civil War. And so in, in a kind of strange circle, I began with a young person's fascination with the Civil War. And then as a professional historian going in a gigantic circle, uh, ended up coming back to the Civil War. 
under those circumstances, it just sometimes surprises me that uh, uh, the Ward C is an, is an area that fewer people are familiar with than I would have thought. And for that reason, I'm kind of excited today to, to have a chance to share with you what was going on because it involves um, not just battles and not just gun smoke and cannon, but it involves uh, international politics. It involves uh, intrigue, spy versus spy. Uh, it involves um, the very careful nuance of language, the very careful nuance of language of what does it mean to be a neutral nation? And uh, what does it mean to, to investigate violations of neutrality? And so I hope you find this lecture to be one that uh, you can be of interest in as much as I am. And I, I'm looking forward to sharing this with everyone. So let's talk about this war on, uh, on the sea. In trying to, to come up with, with an introduction, I went back to a cartoon that I like, uh, a contemporary cartoon. This appeared in Harper's Weekly in February of 1861. And uh, the war had not yet started, but it was quite clear that uh, the Southern states had begun to secede. Uh, the United States of America uh, was looking at fighting a war that might very well seriously damage its status in the world. And so this cartoon appears as sort of a um, assessment of where the United States stood in relationship to England and France. England is represented in this case by the British lion. And that was a common way of, of uh, uh, designating England in, uh, in political cartoons of the time. The other figure right next to the lion uh, you might remember for an earlier lecture is a representation of France. And the reason that you see a bird-like figure there, it's actually a rooster or a cock. Uh, you've heard the term game cock, uh, such as the University of, uh, I think it's the University of South Carolina is the game cocks. And of course, in this case, it represents Napoleon III, who was the emperor of, um, of France and who was um, kind of a cocky fellow, so they, they called him a, a game cock. And uh, you'll notice he looks like a rooster, uh, uh, looks like a cock. And then of course, the final figure, who kind of looks like Uncle Sam with an eagle's head, well, that's the United States in representation of that. Now you have the game cock, France, uh, using the term Johnston. Really, it's just a, a, a diminutive form of of Brother Johnson, Johnson uh, Brother Johnson, um, Jonathan, Brother Jonathan. And um, before the American Civil War, <clears throat> Uncle Sam existed, but Uncle Sam was someone you rarely ever saw. Uh, the figure that would represent the United States was Brother Johnson, Johnston. I don't know why I'm having a hard time saying Jonathan, Brother Jonathan. And so, um, here you have two wise European figures. England, the only superpower in the world. France, a superpower wannabe, and both very powerful. And then the United States that was not a superpower, but it was a regional power. And it was a real pain to both England and France because England and France had ambitions of the new world. And every time they tried to do something in the Western hemisphere, in the new world, they had to mess with the United States. Now, what does France say rather condescendingly uh, to the eagle who clearly is injured? And he says, well, yes, my good Johnston, uh, what think you of the privateering under the present circumstances? What do you think of privateering under the present circumstances? Now, what's that all about? What it's all about is that in a time of war, especially a war that uh, is gonna involve the ocean, smaller powers would engage in what was called privateering. If you think it sounds a lot like pirating, well, it is because it's similar. The difference is that a pirate is committing something that's illegal. And 
if you are on the high seas and you're engaged in piety, uh, then, then if you're captured, there's a very simple result of that. You are executed. Pirates are executed. On the other hand, a privateer is, is a merchantman, or is a civilian, that has been hired and, and works for a government at war. He's been given a certificate that says, uh, you know, uh, he has the permission of our government to prey upon the shipping, both merchant and military of our enemy as a uh, private enterprise, a hired mercenary, or in other words, a privateer. And the United States had in uh, several different engagements, the War of 1812, earlier than that, back in the 1790s in an undeclared war against France, and during the American Revolution, the United States had hired people uh, to fight for them who were privateers. And of course, any ship that they captured, they could uh, take that ship into a port and uh, receive prize money for it. So it was very lucrative to be a privateer, but also very dangerous. And, um, and the United States in particular had used it uh, to, to good effect, to, to damaging the commerce of England during the War of 1812 and, and France earlier in the uh, undeclared naval war that we fought against France in the late 1790s. And so both countries resented the United States for unleashing, uh, for lack of a better term, capitalistic private enterprise warfare upon them. And in both the undeclared war against France and in the War of 1812, uh, both countries suffered severe economic consequences as a result of the success of American privateers. Now the United States is on the verge of engaging in a civil war. And there wasn't any question at all to any of these people that uh, the emerging Confederate States of America would, uh, would commission privateers against the United States. And uh, so in a kind of a condescending, um, smirky way, uh, the British lion and the French cock are asking the wounded American eagle, after all the mischief that you've done over the years, so what do you really think of privateers at this stage of the game? A hint that a significant portion of the American Civil War will be conducted at sea, conducted at sea. To get an idea of the more important places where it's being conducted at the sea, let's take just a second to study this map. Uh, if you look in the upper right-hand corner, you'll see a large arrow, arrow pointing toward a city, and it's the city of Liverpool, England. Liverpool, England will be one of the most important cities of the American Civil War. It is the port that fed the cotton industry in England. A uh, very quick background on Liverpool is, and, and why this happened. Prior to, mm, it's hard to say, prior to about 1820, uh, Liverpool was a very sleepy place. Uh, Liverpool, and uh, a little further to the south, Bath, England, uh, were both on estuaries. That is to say, rivers that rose and fell with the, uh, with the tide. And, and they were ports, but they were unimportant ports because the important ports of England were always on the east side of London um, and, and some other ports along the east coast of England because they traded with the rest of Europe. But the advent of the railroad coming into the 1820s, the advocate of the railroad, one of the first places to make use of the railroad was Liverpool. And it built a railroad of about 15 to 20 miles inland to the sleepy little city of Manchester. But Manchester was becoming a textile manufacturing place. And the textile that it depended upon it originally was English wool, but very quickly it shifted to cotton. And 60% of the world's cotton came from the American South. And, um, 
as a result of, by the time you get to the eve of the American Civil War, one out of every six Englishmen, one out of every six English inhabitants depended either directly or indirectly for their livelihood on the importation of cotton from the American South. So Liverpool is where the cotton trade would come in and out of, and then it would be shipped by these early railroads to Manchester, where cotton then was produced into cloth and, and gave prosperity to one out of every six Englishmen, uh, whether they were a laborer or whether they were the owners of a factory. And as we're gonna see, Liverpool becomes absolutely critical to the Confederate States of America. Now, going a little bit to the south, you see the Azores. Well, the Azores uh, are a small group of islands belonging to Portugal. Portugal was neutral during the American Civil War um, and, and intended to always be neutral. But Portugal had a marvelous way of overlooking things so that when uh, Confederate ships would rendezvous in the Azores to supply or resupply, the Portuguese would um, simply not notice it. And, um, and in fact, of all the countries to benefit from the American Civil War, Portugal probably benefited as much as anybody. Because on the one hand, they, uh, they turned the other, uh, a blind eye to what the Confederacy was using the, their islands for off the coast of Portugal. And on the other hand, as Confederate commerce raiders began to, to make a serious damage to American merchant ships, Portugal said, why don't you switch your registry to Portugal? Because if you, if you belong to Portugal, in other words, if you're registered in Portugal and you're flying a Portuguese flag, then, uh, then you're not at war with the Confederacy. And so the American merchant fleet will eventually be virtually wiped out. And a high percentage of that merchant fleet will cease to be American and will be Portuguese. And so the Portuguese played both sides and were successful in it. And speaking of the Portuguese, Brazil was a Portuguese colony and Brazil had one of the largest slave populations in the world. In fact, there were as many or perhaps more slaves in Brazil than there were in the American South. And so the Portuguese in Brazil as a colony absolutely favored the Confederate cause. And so when a Confederate commerce raider, say the CSS Florida that we'll talk about, uh, when it needed to refit, it easily went into a Portuguese um, uh, port, and there it could depend upon uh, more freedom than a warship normally would get because the Portuguese were sympathetic. But it will be off the coast of Brazil that the Union Navy illegally, and uh, I'll explain that later, but the Union Navy illegally will capture the CSS Florida um, off the coast of Brazil in 1864. Now move northward to the Bahamas. The Bahamas are an English possession. At one time in the um, 17th century, that's the 1600s, and the 18th century, that's the 1700s, the Bahamas were one of the most important um, revenue producing uh, areas of the British Empire producing sugarcane. And, and sugarcane was the value of oil would be today. But, uh, but by the time you get to the American Civil War, the Bahamas had become kind of a backwater of the world. Uh, the sugar trade had declined, um, slavery had been abolished, and therefore the labor system that had supported um, sugarcane uh, had declined. And so the Bahamas and its port Nass Nassau um, really had become kind of a sleepy, pleasant, tropical area, um, waiting around to, to wonder if it ever would wake up again. And it would eventually, in the 20th century, become quite a tourist place. But, uh, but in 1860, it was uh, very quiet, sleepy, pretty, not very prosperous place, until all of a sudden, the Bahamas needed a great deal of supplies you know, guns, weapons, cannon, powder, uniforms, fabric, uh, all the stuff you make a war with. And the Bahamas, especially its, uh, its port at uh, Nassau, became 
one of the busiest places in the world. And of course, that has to do with blockade running. And we'll look at that. So let's, uh, let's continue on. The best place to start is in Liverpool. Uh, Liverpool, which had once been a relatively quiet port, had for the better part of 40 years grown into one of the more important ports in the world. And there were two things that made it uh, an important port. Up until the 1830s, the English will abolish slavery in the, uh, in the, in the slave trade um, in the early, 19, early 1800s. But up until the 1830s, uh, Liverpool had become wealthy by engaging in the slave trade. And it engaged in the slave trade with the American South, with uh, the islands of the Caribbean, and with Brazil. And so having a long history and connection with the slave trade, uh, the important people, the people of commerce and of uh, politics in Liverpool heavily favored the Confederate cause. Uh, and we're, we're gonna see right now just the extent to which they did favor the Confederate cause. During the course of the war, uh, there was a club called the Liverpool Southern Club. And all the best people in Liverpool belonged to that club. And it was designed to, um, uh, it was designed by people who, who wanted to curry favor with the Confederate States of America, who, because of the trade in cotton and earlier trade in, in, in slaves, uh, believed in the Confederate cause. And, um, and it was great fun. You know, you, you got to associate with all your friends. Th think today about, say, out in Hollywood when uh, Hollywood people throw a party to support the Democratic Party. Well, that's exactly what was happening in Liverpool. Uh, the, the good people of Liverpool, uh, believing in the cause of the Confederate States of America, uh, would, would throw parties and uh, activities and um, Sunday afternoon concerts uh, to show their, their solidarity with the Confederacy, to raise money for the Confederacy. And at one point, they raised an incredible amount of money in 1864, in 1864, in something called the Great Southern Bazaar. The Great Southern Bazaar was held for several weeks in one of the largest buildings, a, a kind of like a civic auditorium, St. George's Hall in Liverpool. And uh, the whole purpose of this bazaar was to raise money, this is the way it was expressed, to, to raise money to, to help Southern wounded soldiers who found themselves in Northern prison camps. And they raised 20,000 pounds. Now, 20,000 pounds may not seem like a lot of money in today's pounds, but in the currency of the time, figured into the coinage of today, they raised $625,000 over a period of several weeks, essentially doing what today we would call silent, uh, silent auctions, uh, merchants supplying uh, products that could be sold for the purpose of charity to be given to the, you know, the, to the Confederate cause. Now, what happened with this money was this, it was intended uh, to help Confederates who were POWs, prisoners in, in Northern prison camps, but who had been wounded and who were suffering and it was intended to help them get better medical care. So when the money was raised, how do you get the money uh, to the appropriate place? Well, since it was going to the North for the purpose of helping the Confederate uh, men who were you know, suffering in the prison camps, uh, it was offered to the American ambassador, Charles Francis Adams in London and uh, for him to ship for the express purpose of helping the Confederate soldiers um, who were prisoners, they weren't going south, but who were suffering. And Adams absolutely refused to do it. And of course he was supported in that by the Lincoln government. And so now you've got uh, the equivalent today of $625,000 and it's not going to its purpose. 
Now, what happened was at the end of the Civil War in 1866, uh, that money was eventually shipped to the United States. And at this point, I kind of lose track of it. Apparently, there was a mechanism by which it was redistributed to, uh, to soldiers who had been seriously wounded and, uh, and needing some support um, in the Confederacy who had been prisoners of war. But exactly how that distribution took place, I honestly don't know except that uh, the money was eventually transferred after the war was over with. And there was a committee that did redistribute it uh, to uh, deserving Confederate veterans who, um, who had suffered as a result of their, their uh, prison experiences in Northern prisons. But the reason I'm telling you about this is just to show you how much support the Confederacy had in Liverpool And of course, that support is highly unneutral. There was no question if you were in Liverpool, what the establishment supported. The problem was England was officially neutral during the war, all the way through the war. And the prime minister who was prime minister of England all through that period of time was Lord Palmerston, Lord Palmerston. And Palmerston, plays a, a rather, how shall I say it? I was almost gonna say gray, but, but gray refers to the Confederacy. Let us just say that he plays a, a somewhat shady role during the entire, entire period. On the one hand, he was personally opposed to slavery. Most Englishmen were. But on the other hand, uh, given the choice between the United States and the Confederate States of America, he was intentionally and personally very much in favor of a Confederate victory and very much uh, an opponent of the United States of America. He personally hated America. He hated the United States of America with a passion. You know, today we talk about the long special relationship between the United States and England. Well, that long special relationship did not exist in 1860. Say that again, that long special relationship did not exist in 1860. In 1860, Lord Palmerston's England was the only superpower in the world. Superpower militarily, superpower in terms of control of commerce around the world. But there were people that threatened it. And one of the people that threatened it was a regional power, meaning it's powerful in the Western hemisphere, called the United States of America. And so as Palmerston looked at the long term, he realized that uh, the United States had every opportunity to grow and perhaps even supplant uh, England. But if the Confederacy won, the United States would be seriously wounded. And the odds are the United States would never grow into the superpower it looked like it was about to do. And so both in terms of commerce and in terms of, of future threats to the British Empire, uh, a weakened, severely weakened and divided United States of America was a good thing. That's the way that he saw it. And being the practical politician he was, um, he had every intention of uh, being neutral in the Confederacy's side. In fact, he even seriously considered recognizing the Confederacy but he had a couple of problems before he could do that. And the biggest problem he had, he had two problems. The biggest problem was at home. Uh, the English people as a whole were heavily divided as it related to the American Civil War. They had a tremendous interest in it, but they were divided. Uh, entrepreneurs, businessmen, capitalists, uh, they favored the Confederacy because their prosperity depended upon Southern cotton. On the other hand, the common people of England and the rising middle class of England um, were heavily anti-slave, fervently and religiously anti-slave. And the fervent and religious aspect of that has to do with the, the importance of the rise of the Methodist church within England. Uh, English Methodist, uh, going back to John Wesley, had a very strong core antipathy 
toward American slavery. Now, American Methodists were uh, basically neutral towards slavery until just before the Civil War, when Northern and Southern Methodism split. And Southern Methodism obviously favored slavery, Northern Methodism would favor uh, an anti-slave position. And so uh, English Methodism combined with uh, the rising political importance of the English middle class meant for Palmerston that if he recognized the Confederacy, there was a real chance that he would be uh, uh, voted out of office. And so he had to consider, do I take the chance of my government falling by supporting the Confederacy? And so he needed a Confederate victory uh, before he was willing to take a chance of outright publicly supporting the Confederate cause. The second problem he faced was Abraham Lincoln and the United States of America. Lincoln's position was that this was a war between uh, a domestic conflict. So the support of the Confederacy was interfering with American domestic affairs and that meant war. Does Palmerston want to go to war with the United States? Could England dominate on the seas? Absolutely. Could England uh, fend off much of what the United States could do? Absolutely. Was Canada vulnerable to American actions and invasion? Absolutely. And so was it worth taking a chance of going to war with, Eng uh, with the United States when the United States could do severe damage to Canada and to English possessions uh, that they still had in the Caribbean. And again, only if there was significant Confederate victories in the South would Palmerston be willing to formally recognize the Confederacy. Which then brings us to the issues that were involved, the issues that were involved. What was happening? It all begins with this whole concept of the blockade and, um, and some rather tricky legal issues that involve both England and the United States as it relates to the blockade. Again, when we think of the American Civil War, we tend to only think about 1861 to 1865. But some of the things that happened in the Civil War go back to issues and many of them international and diplomatic issues that go to the beginning of American history and would continue well beyond the American Civil War. And the blockade was a classic example of that. When the South fired on Fort Sumter, Lincoln being familiar with the basic ideas that would become the uh, Anaconda Plan uh, the first thing he did was to declare the ports of the South Southern states blockaded. Now Lincoln was an attorney and he was being advised by very good attorneys and Lincoln knew exactly what he was doing. And he also knew that exactly what he was doing by international law uh, was not recognizable, was not legal. Let me repeat that, it was not recognizable and it was not legal. Now, what do I mean by that? Uh, what I mean by that is that in international law, a blockade is an act of war taken against an enemy nation. An act of war taken against an enemy nation. By Lincoln's definition, there was no enemy nation. Okay. The American South, this creation of the Confederate States of America, was simply a rebellion occurring within the United States, a domestic issue. The only way that you could have a blockade would be if the Confederate States of America was a legal entity and therefore an enemy nation. So on the one hand, practically, Lincoln must blockade the South. On the other hand, in a legal technicality, by creating the blockade, Lincoln had in international law recognized the Confederacy as a separate government. And, um, and that's a fine hair 
but, uh, but it's defined here that would have significant ramifications. Notice the term blockade and belligerency, blockade and belligerency. Um, what that means, blockade and belligerency, is this. Um, England, under the Palmerston government, wanted to support the Confederacy. For him to do that immediately, ran the threat of going to war with the United States, not a good thing, ran the possibility of severe domestic reactions, not a good thing. But Palmerston, because Lincoln had declared a blockade, found a legal loophole. And that legal look, loophole was to give the Confederate States of America the status called belligerency. In other words, not recognizing the government, but saying clearly you have an entity that is at war with the United States, a belligerent. Now, that sounds like the kind of stuff that professors talk about in a, in a stuffy classroom. It sounds like the kind of stuff that legal scholars debate uh, just because they like to debate that sort of thing. But it's really important. If the Confederate States of America is a belligerency, then it has the right to commission privateers. And the privateers are working for a legal government. And the privateers, because they're working for a legal government, a government in belligerency, um, if they're captured, they are not pirates, they are privateers. Private pirates get hanged. Privateers get held as prisoners of war. And that's a significant difference. Far better to be a POW than to be hanged. Your life expectancy is a little longer that way. And so that was one of the effects of declaring a belligerency. At the same time, England is nonetheless neutral. And so England is going to be required uh, to follow the practices of international law. Now, in the following the practices of international law, there was a lot of questions about the nature of a blockade. And it is that nature of what constitutes a blockade that had not only divided England and the United States, but had led to war between England and the United States in the past. I'll say that again. The question of what constitutes a blockade had not only led to conflict between the United States, but it led to war between the United States and England. That's back in 1812 to 1815, the War of 1812. In the War of 1812, England had declared a blockade around the entire continent of Europe. This was the Napoleonic Wars. But the United States said, wait a minute, you don't have enough ships to enforce that. So it's a paper blockade. And, um, and a paper blockade doesn't really constitute a real blockade, and so therefore we don't recognize it. Now, England had the opportunity here to use the American reasoning of a paper blockade and say, we're not gonna recognize it. But instead, the Palmerston government said, we recognize the fact that this is a blockade, even though the Union Navy is not strong enough to enforce it. In other words, here's a principle that we have had been advocating for generations and the United States has been opposing for generations and now the United States is doing it. And we say to the United States, we recognize your right to do it. We recognize your right to blockade the South, which is a belligerency, a point one for the British. Why is that important? Because in future wars, specifically World War I, or what was called the Great War, uh, the United States, having practiced its own paper blockade, would be obligated to practice and support the British paper blockade of Europe in World War I and later in World War II. On the other hand, there was another issue. And that other issue had to do with something called freedom of the seas. Freedom of the seas was important to the United States because we had become a tremendous commerce power. We ship goods all over the world. And a blockade interferes with freedom of the seas. 
but a legal blockade says that you do not have the freedom of the seas to, uh, to transport munitions and other war supplies through a blockade. And, um, and the United States agreed with that. On the other hand, there was a question between England and the United States on something called transshipment, transshipment. Again, a legal technicality, but a legal technicality of tremendous importance. The United States argued in favor of transshipment. Transshipment means that you're trading between you, a neutral country, and another neutral country. And so you cannot blockade, says the United States, a neutral country. England would agree with that. But England argued, if you are taking war supplies to a neutral country, knowing full well that that neutral country will then transship them to, uh, to the belligerent that we're at war with, we have the right to confiscate your ships. I say that again. Even though your ship is, is going to a neutral country, if it's carrying war supplies, that from that neutral country, the war supplies will go to our enemy, the British said, we have the right to stop that ship. And the Americans said, no, you don't, because you're interfering with trade to a neutral country. That's the dilemma. That was one of the reasons we fought the War of 1812. When British stopped, the British stopped American ships on the high seas and they found war supplies on those ships, but the ships are going to Denmark, which was a neutral country. Uh, the British said, too bad. We know that those supplies going to Denmark are going to go to the French and therefore we're going to seize your ship. And, Amer and the American position was, no, it's going to Denmark. It's not going to France. So what happens? Well, during the Civil War, the United States was faced with the British engaging in transshipment. And uh, in this case, the transshipment or the shipment was leaving Liverpool and making its way to Bahamas. And the Bahamas was just a quiet backwater part of the world, not threatening anybody and not needing military supplies. And yet on all of a sudden, it was the location for the largest shipment of military supplies of the time, by far the largest shipment of military supplies of the time. But it was always all going to the Bahamas, which was a part of the British Empire and therefore was a neutral area. Now, the easiest way to prevent those supplies from getting to the United States was to stop it before it got to the Bahamas. In other words, to stop it in the shipment stage. Because those kinds of supplies had to be put on big, heavy, slow merchant ships, which are easily captured or interfered with by warships belonging to the United States. But if the United States did interfere with them, they are actually interfering with, with supplies not meant for the Confederate States of America, but meant for the Bahamas. That's the shipment phase. In spite of the temptation to do that, the Lincoln government said, we will not interfere with the shipment phase. We will interfere with the transshipment phase. And in the transshipment phase, that's where the blockaders, the blockade runners will leave the Bahamas and try to make their way into the Confederacy. And um, why is that important? Well, it's important because one, it made the task much, much more difficult for the Union Navy. And in fact, it enabled the Confederacy to survive much longer than it might otherwise have done. But on the other hand, the larger principle of uh, transshipment which the English had to accept under these circumstances uh, became a diplomatic victory in the long term for the United States. So on the eve of World War I, um, there's this place called Denmark. And Denmark's just a quiet little place located on the Jutland Peninsula, neutral on the eve of World War I. 
But all of a sudden, as World War I is being fought in Europe, Denmark needed brass plumbing supplies. And the United States, which made a lot of brass instruments, was shipping raw brass and raw, raw brass plumbing supplies to Denmark on the eve of World War I. It's amazing how much plumbing supplies and brass the Danes needed in 1914, 1915, 1916, 1917. Of course, why is brass important? because brass was the key ingredient to making cartridges and bombshells, which in fact, the Germans were importing from Denmark and creating into ammunition that would be fired back at the British. In other words, uh, there wasn't any question that the Danes didn't need the brass. It was coming from the United States and eventually it was going to be transshipped to Germany to help fight the British. But the British did not interfere with that shipment because during the Civil War, uh, the Americans did not interfere with the shipment from Liverpool to the Bahamas. Well, let's see how all of that worked out in practicality. That's what's, what's happening. In 1861 to 1865, Nassau and the Bahamas became one of the world's busiest ports. It became one of the world's busiest ports. It was a sleepy little place. The kind of port where ships came in and then they got sugar cane and they took the sugar cane up to New England and it was made into rum. And there was, you know, that's about it. But now between 1861 and 1865, all of a sudden this quiet little place called Nassau in the Bahamas became one of the busiest ports in the world. The citizens of Nassau needed gunpowder. They needed cannon. They needed infield rifles by the tens of thousands. They needed gray cloth. They needed all the sinews. They needed medicines. They needed everything that one would associate with a war making power of a tremendous world class all of it going to these tiny, pleasant islands just north of the Caribbean, just off the coast of Florida. And of course, there's no question about it. This is all actually going to the Confederate States of America if it could get there. And now a couple of personalities to see it all come together. One of the largest figures of the American Civil War a man, if you study him, is bigger than life, bigger than life, both in what, terms of what he did and just bigger than life and what he was. Uh, he was the kind of man that when he walked into a room, you knew a man of authority walked into the room. You knew a man of, of destiny walked into the room. And his name was James Dunwoody Bullock. And James Dunwoody Bullock was one of the most important people to the Confederate cause. It's a case of spy versus spy, and he's one of the two spies that we're gonna talk about. James Dunwoody Bullock for the Confederate States of America. He was born 1823 to a prominent family in Georgia, a family involved in not just raising cotton, but involved in the international trade in cotton with powerful connections in, well, yes, Liverpool. And as a young man, starting out at about 17, he joined the United States Navy. And from 1840 to 1854, he served in the United States Navy, almost all of it in the Atlantic and much of it landing at uh, ports in England, including Liverpool. And because of his family's connections to Liverpool, commercial connections to Liverpool, um, he went out of his way to make sure that whenever he was in Liverpool, he, um, he made connections with important people of commerce in Liverpool. So not only was he there representing the United States Navy, but he was also there representing his family's com considerable commercial enterprise associated with Liverpool. And then because he had a growing family, he, he resigns the Navy in 1854. And for the next seven years, uh, he's, in great, he's engaged in the shipping industry uh, out of New York City. And of course, most of that shipping industry involved uh, transportation 
of ships and goods from the West Indies to Liverpool. So not surprisingly, when he volunteered for the Confederate Navy down in Montgomery, Alabama, which was the capital at the time, where has he sent? He sent to Liverpool and he's sent there to do things that the Confederacy desperately needed. Such things as helping to create a Confederate Navy by getting warships for the Confederacy, of uh, encouraging the building and the running of blockade runners that would uh, go from uh, the Bahamas to various Southern ports delivering war supplies. And for, if at all possible, building commerce raiders and ironclads and anything that they could do to facilitate the Confederate States of America controlling the high seas against the United States of America. And the Confederacy could not have chosen a more effective person. In fact, both in the North and the South, it was acknowledged that he was the most dangerous man that the South possessed. That was the term that was always used by him. It didn't matter if he was the North cursing, the, cursing him or in the South where he would become a hero. He was considered to be the most dangerous man that the South has because he's the fellow that keeps the war going. He's the fellow that sees to it the Confederate armies in the field are being supplied. He's the fellow that works desperately to get around all of the neutrality of England. And there's a, a term that's often used, it's called plausible denial. Everything that, that he did was illegal under British law, no question about it. But everything that he tried to do, he did it in such a way that there would be plausible denial, that the British government could see what he was doing, knew what he was doing, but they can always find a reason to say, we can't really do anything about it because it's not doing anything illegal. And so this is a man who, who really keeps the Civil War going. Absolutely, without him, the Confederacy would not have survived nearly as long as it did. Among the things that he did was to uh, clandestinely purchase hundreds of thousands of infield rifles, which was the main uh, rifle of the Confederacy. Um, he shipped cannon and power and much powder and much more, again, to the Bahamas that went to the Confederacy. Uh, he encouraged the English and the Scottish shipwrights to build uh, blockade runners, which were a very specific kind of ship designed to do nothing more than to outrun the Union Navy and to get supplies to the Confederacy. He constructed or purchased 12 warships for the Confederacy that included, among other things, uh, the CSS Florida, the CSS Alabama, and the CSS Shenandoah. And he, he contracted for something called the Laird Rams. And in those three statements, I've just outlined the balance of what we're gonna talk about. Facilitating what he did was his connections to a company called Frazier, Trenholm and Company. Now, Frazier, Trenholm and Com Company uh, is essentially based out of Charleston, South Carolina. A man by the name of, of George Trenholm, very wealthy, in fact, super wealthy. And he and his family um, had long been in the connections between Charleston, South Carolina and Liverpool. And as a very wealthy and banking family, um, they financed much of the cotton trade that went on prior to the American Civil War. When the war came, George Trenholm immediately transferred the center of his business activities from Charleston, South Carolina to, not in Liverpool, Nassau in the Bahamas. And at the same time, he had offices with very important Englishmen in Liverpool. And so there's going to be this tremendous connection between Liverpool and this company, and now its new headquarters in Nassau and the Bahamas. In essence, how was the Confederate States of America able to purchase and spend the kind of money that was necessary for James Bullock to work? It was because it was being financed by this company called Frazier, Trenholm and Company. 
if you wonder where the Frazier comes from, um, during the Civil War, he hired on a partner to help and his name was Frazier, but the man behind it is George Trenholm. During the entire Confederacy, Trenholm was a unofficial advisor to, um, to the Confederacy's uh, treasury, treasury department until the last year of the war when he became the cabinet officer with the Confederate Treasury Department. During the course of the war, uh, his company made a real stake. They were betting on a Confederate victory, which you know did not happen and his company goes bankrupt. But meanwhile, even as his company is going bankrupt, he heavily invests in blockade runners. He owned, he owned 60 blockade runners about 10% of all the blockade runners that existed, he owned. And he made a profit of $9 million off of those uh, blockade runners. Now, again, if $9 million doesn't sound like a whole much, bunch of money, multiply that by 30, and you come up to $9 million in the year 2020, it's $270 million was his personal profit from the American Civil War because of his investment in 60 blockade runners that more than offset the fact that his banking firm heavily invested in the Confederacy failed. So he comes out of the Civil War okay, financially. Opposing him and opposing Bullock was a quieter man, quieter in style, but determined and equally as determined and equally as talented as, as James Bullock. And his name was Thomas H. Dudley. And Dudley came from a well prominent New Jersey family. He'd been an attorney. Uh, he eventually just on the eve of the Civil War was appointed to the American consul, uh, the head of the American consulship in, uh, uh, in Liverpool. And that many worked directly under the American envoy envoy uh, Charles Francis Adams. The word envoy was used at that time instead of ambassador, but it's the same thing. So it would be the American ambassador, Charles Francis Adams, was the man he reported to. And even though his technical title was consul, uh, in reality, he was in effect uh, the CIA. He was the, uh, the spy master uh, for the American cause in uh, in Liverpool. And he put together a network of over 100 agents. Many of these were workers in the shipyards, like the Laird shipyards. One even was a, a, a sailor on board uh, the CS Alabama, so that anytime the CS Alabama went into a port, um, they were able to keep track of where it was and where it planned to go. And uh, eventually that will lead to the sinking of the Alabama by the American warship Kearsarge um, on June 19th, 1864. And of course, the building of something called the Laird Rams was something he thoroughly investigated, knew all about, had plans, knew the, um, the shenanigans behind um, how it was being given plausible denial. And he provided all of this information, not only to the government in the United States, but more importantly, he provided all of that information to Charles Francis Adams Sr., who was the American envoy or the American ambassador to the court of St. James, which means the American ambassador to England. Now, just a word on Charles Francis Adams. The United States of America could not have asked for a better person to represent the United States in England than Charles Francis Adams. In fact, his grandfather, his grandfather had been the first American ambassador to England after the American Revolution. Maybe you've heard of his grandfather, I suspect you have. His name was John Adams. And you probably know him better because he was the second president of the United States and one of the writers of the Declaration of Independence. He was cooperating with Thomas Jefferson and three others to write the Declaration of Independence. And not only was John Adams his grandfather, but another United States president by the name of John Quincy Adams was his father and John Quincy Adams. Uh, had an extensive background in diplomacy. In other words, Charles Francis Adams grew up 
in one of the most important families in the United States, a family highly skilled in politics and even more highly skilled in international affairs. And he was the American representative uh, to the court of St. James, to the, uh, to the English nation during the Civil War. And he was highly effective. In part, he was highly effective because of all the information being provided by Thomas H. Dudley, who was keeping an eye on the activities of James um, James B. Bullock, okay? Dunwoody Bullock. And all of this had to do with English neutrality that wasn't really neutral. Remember, Palmerston all through the war claimed English neutrality and all of it was based on plausible denial, plausible denial. Things were happening, things were clearly happening, no question about what was happening but if the British could find some way to, to say, well, it's not quite what it looks like. If you really look at it, uh, what you think is happening isn't happening. And now let's proceed to see that. And we begin with blockade running in the little port of Nassau in the Bahamas. What about blockade running? What can I tell you about the blockade runners? Well, first of all, the blockading ships that were involved or the blockade running ships were specially built ships. They were built for no other purpose than to run the blockade between the Bahamas and various ports in the Southern Confederacy. Let me explain. Notice the peculiar look of these ships. Very few sails, almost all engine. Now, Steam engines and steam power had come a long ways by the time you get the Civil War. But there's a problem with steam power. And, and the problem has a name. It's a product. It's called coal. So almost all steam-powered ships at the time, its primary form of locomotion was still sail. Because you use the boilers and the steam only when you needed a great deal of speed. Well, by contrast to especially naval ships and the steam packets that were going, a steam packet is a regularly scheduled ship, which you could do with steam power. Um, even those primarily relied on sail because coal is very bulky. These ships, like you see here, if they were gonna cross the ocean, would have to be completely filled with coal and no room for, uh, for supplies. So technically these ships were built to carry commerce. That's plausible denial. When the British are building these blockade runners, they're building commerce ships. And the British government always said, now you, you think these are being built for war, but after all, they're, they're just private enterprise ships that are being built for commerce. The problem is, in order to have enough space for commerce, you sacrifice coal. And these ships have only enough coal to light up those boilers and move as fast as they can. And they could move very fast by the standards of the time um, and to outwit uh, the much slower warships of the United States of America. They're built for short distances. That's the Bahamas to the Confederacy. And they're built for absolute speed so that they would have enough um, room and enough speed to, to engage in commerce, illegal commerce with the Confederacy. Um, numbers, the number that left the Confederacy and ships stuff to the Bahamas about 400 during the course of the war. The number that left the Bahamas for the Confederacy itself about 600. And that's quite a number actually. And then you multiply that number by the number of times that they shipped. Some did only one or two times. And when they did one or two times, uh, they had a tendency to be captured. Uh, that's why it would be only one or two times. But on the average, they succeeded five times before they were captured. There was about an 80% capture rate on the part of the United States, I'm sorry, an 80% success rate, 20% capture rate on the part of the United States Navy. So 80% of these ships made it to the Confederacy. It took two journeys to completely pay all of your expenses for the, uh, 
uh, for the, uh, uh, the blockade runner. After that, everything the blockade runner did was pure profit. And during the course of their lives on the average, ownership of a blockade runner meant that you would make a total of 500% profit. In other words, for every $1 you invested, you got $5 back. You broke even if it made only two journeys. Once it made four journeys, you were ahead. And on the average, it was caught on the fifth journey. But many of these made eight, nine, and 10 journeys before they either wore out, they wore out pretty quickly, or before they were captured or burned. So these are very profitable ships, even though they're engaged in trade that is absolutely illegal. How dangerous was it to do? Again, look at that ship. It was intentionally designed first for speed. Secondly, notice how low to the water it is. It makes for a very poor target. Union warships could send a cannon shot up to a mile or a mile and a half. But given technology at the time, a cannon shot from anywhere more than 50 yards uh, had a prob problematical chance to, um, uh, to hit something. In other words, when you've got a rolling sea, rolling ships, and the opponent is also rolling and zigzagging and disappearing and traveling very fast, um, lots of cannon shots were fired at these uh, blockade runners, but very rarely, very rarely were they even hit. And even one or two hits would not sink them. And so the blockade runners, um, it was exciting, it was fun. The, the crews were highly skilled and highly motivated and very well paid, as was the people that owned them. Uh, ended up making tremendous profits with these blockade runners. In fact, Rear Admiral David Porter, who by 1864 was in charge of the uh, eastern part of the blockade uh, squadron for the United States Navy. Look at what he had to say about them. As late as the 1864, blockade running seemed almost as brisk as ever. The new class of blockade runners were very fast and sometimes came in and played around our vessels and because they were entirely built for speed. It was very difficult for the United States to stop them once they left Nassau or stop them once they left the coast for Nassau. Now to repeat, the easier way would have been to capture the slow, big transport ships, merchant ships between Liverpool and Nassau. But to do that would to win for the British their opposition to transshipment. And so the Lincoln government forbid uh, interfering with the trade from Liverpool to Nassau and all opportunities involved were very exciting, very fast, and normally successful uh, blockade running done by the, uh, by the Civil War blockade runners leaving in, in just a quick, fast, usually at night, preferably when there was no moon or better yet, when there was a mild rainstorm and, um, and you, could, you could succeed, very much so. So the Confederacy benefited, survived, uh, flourished for a while because of the blockade runners. On the other hand, the Confederacy also succeeded with something called the Commerce Readers. Uh, here you have Captain Raphael Sims, who was the most famous uh, of uh, the captains of a blockade runner. He was the captain of the uh, CSS, the Confederate States of America ship, uh, the, uh, the Alabama. These blockade runners, in effect, succeeded in destroying the American merchant fleet. Those ships that weren't sunk are captured or burned by uh, Confederate commerce raiders, uh, very quickly change their legal registry from the United States to other countries. And the main country that benefited from this change of registry and therefore change of commerce was Portugal. Portugal uh, really benefited from the American Civil War. So there were three commerce readers. There were, there, there were about 30 commerce readers altogether, but there were three commerce readers that became particularly famous. The CSS Florida, 
the CSS Alabama, and the Shenandoah. And just a quick statement about each one of them. The first one was purchased. It was a, uh, it was a merchant ship, a very fast merchant ship, but a merchant ship. Uh, and it was purchased by James Bullock, that marvelous agent for the Confederacy in, in Liverpool. And um, its original name was the Orito. It was registered in England. It was owned by English merchants. It, uh, it was a commerce ship. And, but <clears throat> there wasn't any question about its purpose because unlike a blockade runner, um, it left England with a British crew and a British captain and British registry. And the British registry said, it's a commerce ship. And it shows up under this name, Orito, in, uh, in Nassau in August of 1862. Now, American agents under Dudley clearly knew what it was for. And American agents in Nassau had been informed what it was for. So when the ship ends up in Nassau, the American agents immediately apply to the governor and say, uh, you cannot allow this ship out. It is a warship for the Confederacy. And the governor, already having received instructions from the Palmerston government, said, uh, we'll look into it. That was always the British response. I'm glad to learn this. We'll look into it. We'll investigate. And so from April to August, 1862, an investigation and testimony was held. And it was clear from almost all of the testimony what that ship's purpose was. But in the end, the governor declared, um, no, this ship is a private ship. It's registered as a private ship. There's no indication of armament or supplies or anything that goes to the Confederacy. And so on August the 7th, 1862, it was cleared to set sail. And it set sail just off the waters of Nassau. And lo and behold, another ship comes up. And over a two day period of time, they load onto it cannon and powder and a crew from the Confederate States of America, at least the, the captain and the officers from the Confederate States of America. And it suddenly became the Confederate ship Florida, and second only to the Alabama, will it be successful as a commerce raider. Over the next several months, it engaged in two major voyages. In those voyages, it uh, sank or captured 37 merchant ships, and the prize money from those merchant ships were sold uh, to, to support the Confederacy. Um, it also captured a number of these ships and turned them into commercial raiders. And so the four or five ships that were worthy of being commercial raiders captured an additional 23 uh, merchant ships. So 60 merchant ships, either directly or indirectly, uh, were, were uh, taken out of action. That's a considerable portion of the American merchant fleet uh, during, during the Civil War um, by the Florida. But the fate of the Florida is kind of interesting. Uh, any ship of its type needed constant repair. In other words, you didn't just sail around forever. Uh, you had from time to time to put into port because these are wooden ships and wooden ships need a lot of caulking, a lot of uh, material rammed between its boards to keep the water out. And by the time you get to uh, September and October of 1864, the CSS Florida needed a lot of repairs. And it was in an unfriendly world. The part of the world that was friendly to it was in Brazil. The people of Brazil, the colony of Brazil, was favorable to the Confederacy, was favorable to slavery. And so the CSS Florida ends up in, in the port of uh, Bahia in Brazil. Now, the American government knew it was there. There's spies all over the world. And the USS uh, why? I never can pronounce it right. Uh, what, what she said. What? I, I practiced and practiced saying that. And now I'm giving the lecture and I can't say it. Uh, what she said. What she said. The USS What she said was sent to neutralize the Florida. 
And so it ends up on port. It ends up right next to the, to the Florida, but it's in a neutral port. So it cannot engage in an act of war because that would violate Brazilian neutrality. So what happens? The watch is set uh, on October the 7th after a good deal of wrangling. And it was obvious that uh, uh, Florida was not going to be impounded by the Brazilians. Just at dawn, just at the first light of dawn, uh, the crew of the CSS Florida looked out and the watch is set is sailing straight for them and rams them. Now the purpose of ramming in this case was not to sink it, it was just to jar it real hard to knock everybody down because the watch is crew immediately flooded on to uh, the Florida, captured it, and then the now captured Florida and the watch is set set sail. Now what did the watch is set done? It had violated the neutrality of Brazil. Even as they're sailing out, the Brazilian uh, uh, fortress nearby was lobbing cannon shells at both ships, didn't hit them. It's almost impossible to do. Uh, you just fire a lot of cannon shots and you hope that one of them hits. And, um, and the Florida and the watch is set, make it all the way back to the United States. And what happens in the United States? Well, the captain of the watch is set becomes a hero, national hero, but he has broken international law. He's broken the policy of the United States government, which, you know, would be suffer if we break international law. And so he has to be court-martialed and he was court-martialed and he was found guilty and he was dismissed from service. And furthermore, the court quite correctly said that the CSS Florida would have to be returned to Brazil. And it was obvious that if it went back to Brazil, the Confederate agents would very quickly uh, take the Florida back over and once again use it as a commerce raider. So two things happened. First of all, the captain was dismissed, but then Lincoln's secretary of the Navy, after 10 days, reinstated him. And 10 years later, the man would retire a rear admiral. And as for the Florida, uh, quite according to international law, it set sail to return to Brazil. Before it could get out of port, it um, ran into another ship and was so sufficiently damaged. No one was injured, no one was harmed, but the Florida sank. And because it sank, it was not able to be returned as it had been promised to do uh, to Brazil. As for the Alabama, uh, it was being built by the Laird Company. Its designation was ship number 290, but everybody knew what it really was. So how do you get ship 290 out of England? And the answer is it was named the Erica and it's a commerce ship, except again, it's built for speed and, and not very much um, uh, com uh, commerce cargo capacity. And besides that, it has extra thick uh, planks to support cannon. And um, so what Bullock does, he gets a bunch of his friends from um, uh, citizens of, of Liverpool and they throw a party. And they're on the deck of the Enraka taking a, 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 a shakedown cruise just in the waters off of Liverpool. And then all of a sudden a tug shows up and all the people of Liverpool gets off and the ship sails down to the Azores where the Portuguese aren't paying any attention. And it is armed very quickly. Confederate officers are put on board. And then in 10 journeys, it does more damage to the American merchant fleet than any other single ship. Until eventually, um, it has to return to a port and it goes to the French port of Cherbourg and there, the USS Cursarge, which had been informed by Charles Francis Adams, who had been informed by Thomas Dudley that the CS Alabama was now in Cursarge, uh, was in uh, Cherbourg. And there, it engaged in a battle and it was sunk. The Shenandoah, originally a ship built called the Sea King, again, leading the war, was sent to the Pacific and off the coast of Alaska, um, it completely destroyed the whaling industry. 
In fact, one historian has entitled his article, uh, The Confederate Ship That Saved the Whales, because uh, the, uh, the, the Northern whaling industry uh, never survived all of the damage the Shenandoah did. The Shenandoah ends up doing something kind of special. It completely circumnavigates the globe. In 1865 in June, not aware that the war was winding down, in fact, it was over with, it fired the last shot of the Confederacy, just a blank shot that uh, warned the ship to heave to. That captain said the war is over with, but, uh, but the captain of the Shenandoah didn't believe him. But then later that day, he captured another ship and there was a newspaper from San Francisco that said the war is over with. And at that point, the privateer, Shenandoah, became a pirate ship and the crew was subject to being hanged. And so it left the Pacific, sailed around the Cape of, uh, sailed around the uh, Straits of Magellan in South America. And in November 6, 1865, arrives back in Liverpool. And in Liverpool, it hauls down the Confederate flag. And it is the last time that the Confederate flag um, is flown anywhere uh, as part of the Confederacy. Incidentally, that particular Confederate flag is the only Confederate flag to completely circumnavigate the globe on board the Shenandoah. The Laird Rams. The Confederacy needed warships to get out to the Union Navy. And Bullock, who was good friends with the Laird brothers in England, um, provided sufficient mo money to build two of the best warships available with all the newest technology, including turrets, including ironclad, including speed, including plenty of places to put coal, two ships that would uh, severely harm the British, the American Navy, if they were allowed to sail. They were so dangerous in 1863. Oh, by the way, Bullock uh, put up a real fine cover story, plausible deniability. He had a French company order the ships for the Pasha of Egypt, even though everybody knew, including Thomas Dudley, who had all the evidence uh, that these were being built for the Confederacy. Under the circumstances, Lincoln and his government considered actually sending American warships into Liverpool and up the estuary to bombard the Laird Ship Company to stop those ships because the only place that the, the United States could deal with it would be in port and uh, before they were finished. Fortunately, Lincoln didn't have to do that because that would have meant war with England, no question about it. Instead, using the evidence provided by, uh, uh, by Dudley, Thomas Dudley, uh, Ambassador Charles Francis Adams went to the British government on September 5, 1863 and did something very undiplomatic. Diplomatic language is vague, it is polite, but Charles Francis Adams said quite simply, if these ships sir, uh, sail, it would be superfluous in me to point out to your Lordship that this is war. In other words, no hemming, no humming, no diplomatic language, no ships sail, the United States goes to war against England. At that point, there was no plausible denial. The British government knew, and the British government purchased those warships and they became part of the British Navy. British, Britain's undiplomatic activities at the end of the war left a tremendous bitter opposition between England and the United States. Short of war and almost on the point of war, relationships between the England and the United States because of the English proclamations of neutrality and acts of very much being unneutral uh, left the two countries bitter. Fortunately, the two countries did something that had never been done before. They agreed to let their grievances be judged, arbitrated is the correct term, by other countries. Initially, the United States demanded that England pay the United States $3 billion, 
and that's in 1872 dollars. Roughly, uh, well, multiply that by 30, 900 billion dollars in today's money. And uh, I'm sorry, 900 million dollars in today's money. And um, so it was $3 million, there we go, $3 million to the United States. No, $30 million, I, I'm not getting this straight. At any rate, it was roughly the equivalent to uh, nearly a billion dollars that, that the United States wanted. Uh, England negotiated and finally agreed to a sum that roughly approximated the amount of damage that the Alabama and the Shenandoah and the Florida did, um, plus some of the other commerce raiders, and it came to $15 million. $15 million in today's money is $450 million that the English agreed to pay the United States for its not being on top of uh, the unneutral activities that were going on on its own shores. And that was the war at sea, the Dakota. James Dunwitty Bullock, had a half sister, a younger half sister, his sister. Her name was Martha Bullock and she was a Georgia peach. She was a beauty from the state of Georgia and a great catch. And there was a prominent family in New York known as the Roosevelt's and some pronounce it Roosevelt's. And she married into the Roosevelt family or Roosevelt family and had children. And one of her children was named Theodore. And Theodore became uh, a Secretary of Navy at the one time, Assistant Secretary of Navy, and then later President of the United States, and a man who emulated and much loved the stories of his half uncle um, and her half brother, and became someone who made the United States Navy one of the most powerful navies in the world. Well, I hope this has been interesting. And we have just a few moments, but I'm happy to take questions. And let's just see what, uh, what people want to know. Nisha? Okay. There are a couple of questions in um, the chat from Steve. Uh, he asked, did they help build ships in Liverpool? I'm sorry. Say so that I... I it, it was so loud, I, I could only hear some of the words. There was something help in Liverpool, but I didn't get the rest. Did they help build ships in Liverpool? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, the Laird brothers, uh, their shipyard was out just outside of, uh, 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 just to the east of Liverpool on the estuary of the river that's there. And um, typically 30, 30 ships a year were being built in Liverpool. But during the American Civil War, that increased significantly. So they were building blockade runners. They were building uh, uh, the Alabama and, of course, the Laird Rams. And there were other ships that were being built and eventually used by the Confederacy, uh, all of which sailed out under false names, with false pretenses, and pretended to be merchant ships, except for the Laird's, of course, uh, the Rams. And uh, uh, following a pattern that was clear and open, and Bullock was doing it, but there was always plausible denial, and the English looked the other way until you get to the Laird Rams. Okay, the second question is um, how much or how many ships did it take to sustain the blockade? Um, you know, I don't have that figure with me right now, and I should have looked it up, but some, a lot of things I should do in life. At the opening of the American Civil War, the United States Navy, as had been its tradition, uh, had a good modern Navy, but it only had a handful of ships. And a story that maybe, and hopefully I can work in in the next session, the next uh, series, is how the Navy was built up and the innovative things that the Northern Navy did, especially in the case of building uh, monitor class ships. You know, that starts out with that little ship called the Monitor and eventually you get larger ones. Um, but the British Navy, the American Navy had several hundred ships by the war's end, but it very quickly got rid of those ships. So much so that by the time you get to the 1880s, the United States almost goes to war with Chile 
with Jubilee, with Chile. And um, the people of Chile had three or four world-class warships. And even though the United States had more ships, uh, we made peace with Chile pretty quickly because uh, the Chilean Navy by 1880 uh, would have given the United States a run for its money. And that was too dangerous. In fact, that became at that point, the stimulus to build the modern Navy that Theodore Roosevelt will continue. So we built a powerful Navy. The United States built a powerful Navy during the war that sustained the blockade, but never quite defeated uh, the blockade runners. And, um, uh, but I can't give you the exact number. And then as soon as the war was over with, as we traditionally do in America, we said it was too expensive and we cut back. We cut back so far that we were almost in trouble by the 1880s. And that turned around to building the modern Navy that we have today. Okay, Fred, this is uh, Shelby. Misha had to run, so I'm um, filling in for her. I'm gonna go ahead and unmute everybody and see if we have any other questions. Okay, everybody is unmuted. Do we have any questions for Fred? Any additional? Thank you very much. This is Myrna and we have to go, but thank you very, very much. Shelby, I think there's two more in the chat. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, or, oh yeah. Um, or, how much, uh, Fred, how much steel was used in the ships? Uh, next to none. Um, oh. because, yeah, because the, the use of steel, remember these are ironclads. And you have something called the Bessemer program, uh, the Bessemer process invented in England. And at the same time in America, independent of that, uh, a guy named Kelly invents the same process, though it's typically called the Bessemer process, but it's really the Bessemer Kelly process. And that's in the 1870s. In the 1870s, that high quality and inexpensive steel uh, becomes available because of these two processing. Uh, before that, steel existed. But steel was, oh my goodness, it was very, very difficult to make. You could make small weapons out of steel, but nothing like uh, um, uh, a warship. And so iron, which is much more brittle, but still much more resistant to damage than is wood, uh, would have been what would be used during the period of the Civil War. Okay, that's great. One more question. Were other countries afraid of the Union or just busy with their own issues? That's a very good question. And the answer is France, England uh, in particular, the Spanish as well, but the Spanish, uh, well, let me start. France and England were there very much pro CSA, pro Confederate States of America. Um, and the main reason was the, pan the potential for that Panama Canal. Uh, England's a world power, France is a world power wannabe, and the United States is a local power. And all of them recognized that building a canal across the Isthmus of Panama would give whichever country did it control of one of the six choke points of trade in the world. And so France wanted that, England wanted that, the United States wanted that. And that made uh, England and France very much pro-Confederate. Now, Spain was very much pro-Confederate and a few blockade runners went out of Cuba. But the problem with the Spanish is the Spanish were weak militarily by this time. There's still a significant empire in the Western hemisphere. And the Spanish knew that the Americans wanted much of that empire. So Spain could do nothing and would do nothing to upset the United States. Uh, for fear that the United States would fight a war against them and take their empire away. And you know what? We eventually did. Um, and uh, uh, so Spain was antagonistic toward the United States, favored the Confederacy, but didn't do anything for fear of the United States using that as an excuse to go to war and take Cuba and to take other parts of the Spanish empire and to, uh, to put pressure on the Central American Canal which also the Spanish wanted to build, but there was no hope that they could do it. Okay, great. John, did you have a question for Fred? No. Okay, maybe not. Um, 
<laughs> Sorry, I muted myself. Anybody else have a question for Fred? Okay, this is our last class before Thanksgiving. So I will wish all of you a, a wonderful week next week and a wonderful Thanksgiving and see you all um, back here. Fred, when is your next presentation? Do you know offhand? You know, I didn't realize next Thursday is, is Thanksgiving because I was planning on giving a lecture next Thursday. So obviously I'm not going to do that. Uh, no, I do when the next one is, but I'm sure I'll, I'll know within 15 minutes after this is over with. <laughs> <laughs> well, if I, I should be able to remember, but I think it may be the first or second week in, first week in December, I think is my guess, but Listen, I put well, you on the spot and that's not fair. So well, this, this um, is the third one. I know that December, the I think December the, December the 8th and 10th um, will, uh, will be the last two. And I'll be up in my cabin, but I'll be able to do it from my cabin in East Tennessee. That's, that shouldn't be a problem. Well, so, and you need to build in some extra time to show us around when you're there and, uh, and especially outside so we can see how beautiful it is. I'll, I'll take some pictures. It's, uh, remember, all the leaves are going to be gone, but uh, uh, I'll do that for you. I'll, okay. I'll give you a little bit of a, 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 a little taste. Yeah. Well, well, thank well, you. For Everybody for being here today and again um, have a wonderful Hello, Fred. Day. Yes. Oh. One last question. Uh, the ships that remained after the Civil War, what did they do with the uh, ships from the South? Um, there, there were only a handful, most of them, some of them, a very few number of them uh, ended up in part of the American Coastal Navy. But uh, the amount of, of razor blades, in essence, that were created at the American Civil War was quite quite large. In other words, uh, um, these were, for the most part, um, um, scrapped. Now, there was one ship, and I'll, I'll do this uh, right away, called the, uh, the Stonewall, meaning Stonewall Jackson. And it had been built in France, and it was the equivalent of the Laird Rams, but it shows up uh, in May of 1865, after Lee had surrendered in April, and, uh, and it immediately was captured by the Union Army. And uh, it eventually was sold to the Japanese and became the first significant warship of the newly created Japanese Navy. Wow. And, and a number of these uh, blockade runners, by the way, were refitted and, and sold to private concerns and engaged in, in small trade, like around uh, the Caribbean or in the Mediterranean in the post-Civil War period. Okay, Steve, I'm sorry that I cut you off and you still had a question. Um, I no, did I'm sorry. I've, I've always been, I, this has always been one of my fascinations with the uh, Navy battles during the Civil War because you don't think about the Navy in the Civil War. Well, the, the, the of course, we haven't covered things like the Battle of Mobile Bay or the Battle of Memphis in June of 1862, right off the Memphis, Tennessee, which is one of the, which is sometimes referred to as the only fleet battle of the entire Civil War. There was a Confederate fleet and a Union fleet off the coast city of Memphis, um, and we haven't covered that. That's it. I thought when I made up this uh, idea of what I wanted to do, I could cover everything, and I'm beginning to realize I can't, <laughs> and I'm doing my best. It, it, any questions anybody has, uh, I try to keep my email address out there and I, I'll happily respond to anybody, okay? I thought so if you could do your that, it'd be nice to get some more information from you. I'll, I'll try to make another lecture in the next round in which we might deal with, I'm just gonna call it the River War. How does that sound? Um, awesome. And, yeah, I can you can give the girls your uh, email address so we can ask you questions for research material, that'd be great. Okay, it, uh, I'll be sending this, uh, you know, the, in a PDF form, these images that you looked at, and I always, thank include, you very much. always include my email address with that. Okay, thank you. All right, perfect. Thank you all. Our next class with Fred is uh, Thursday, December 3rd. Okay, uh, 3rd, man, 3rd, 8 p.m. That's going to be boom, boom, boom. That's right, that's right. All right, everybody, have a great rest of your day, and thank you for being here. Thank Bye -bye. you, Fred. Thank you, Fred. Bye.
and say, we've laid it out. Here's the corruption. But because the country yeah. needs to move on, right. um, I will, 
I don't think she was working so hard. Uh, step aside or stand aside. I'll stand aside. And then he needs to go down to Georgia and hold a bunch of rallies. And, yeah, you know. and then he needs to uh, be the, the shadow governor for the next four years. But, but he needs to prove that they have all these fraudulent, irregular ballots. Well, that's what I'm saying. That that will be part He's of got it. to do that. Well, that's what that's what you do over the next two or three years. The Republicans uh, they go after Hunter Biden. They have to go after Hunter Biden. They have to they have to to hold the the, the, yeah, the high uh, ground. Right. Well, CM, M, CMBC, mm. MSNBC, MSNBC, whatever it is. Yeah. As you can tell, MSNBC. MSNBC. Yeah. No, MSNBC. Yeah, I understand. Uh, in other words, my dream is pretty high up in that direction. Are you okay? Yeah, I just, I don't, I have a little low here. So it's more accurate. Yeah, well, I understand. Uh, apparently, next spring I'll be teaching classes from uh, about, uh, four, th four to 5.30, which gets us past the afternoon lull. That's their definition of late afternoon. I would prefer teaching, actually, from from six to nine, but that's that's just my preference. I always like teaching that. But I always like teaching you know, in, in evening classes. I would always schedule myself one night class every every week, and um, usually on Monday or Tuesday. And that way, it would free up my days to do other stuff. And uh, uh, that was just what I did. But anyway, but in other words, pull a uh, pull an Andrew Jackson. Andrew Jackson was shafted in 1824, and he and his people rode the corrupt bargain issue for four years, and he got overwhelmingly elected president in 28. Uh, and I think that. If Trump can uh, hit that pounding, it is a fair chance. Well, if it, you know, and if Biden has to put in Pocahontas and uh, Susan Rice and Bernie and to hit all his cabinet positions, yeah, you know, you know, really, that uh, those people are extreme. Mm -hmm. You know, Republicans hold the Senate. And screw them into the wall, but I, you know, four more years of this BS is just—I don't know, man. It's well, there's no—I mean, it ain't good for the country. There, there hasn't, from election night on, there's not been any question in my mind about the amount of corruption. The problem is, given our system, uh, you, know, you, you can't transfer of power. You've got—you've got to have continuity of power. Peaceful transfer. Mm -hmm. uh, well, hell, he's probably lining it up to do that. But you ought to heard Giuliani. I mean, he laid it out, and he had affidavits, he had witnesses, he had the proof, I think. And even if half of it was right, yeah, or a third of it's right, it still stinks. The whole deal. Well, I really, what kind of settled it for me was of all things. Uh, you have to understand, I just came off a, a really hard, intense lecture. I, I was teaching stuff that's on the edge of my knowledge, and that, that really takes it out of me. So I'm, I'm not quite as cogent as I like to. Who's the guy down in Austin? You see him all the time on Fox. Oh, it's all Paxton. Uh, no, 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 no. The, the, the guy that was Bush's chief advisor. Oh, Carl Rove. Yeah, Rove. Uh, he's a rhino. Well, I, he I've, really always, is. I've always liked him. He, he came out using his little pad and he pointed all the places where Hillary did this and Biden did this. And there was, you know, a slight variation on each one, as you would expect. And then all of a sudden, in just four places, you know, Detroit. They flooded the market. They flooded the market. Now, 
That's kind of suspicious. And and Trump had supposedly, according to Giuliani, he had significant leads in all those states until they shut it down at the evening. And then here comes the ballots. Plus, these illegal supervision. Well, right. The pollsters were ousted. And then this uh, this uh, company that makes these electronic polling devices, that is what bothers me more than anything, because they claim that they can manipulate the, 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 the ballot uh, software to where it can show anything they want to, especially yeah. if these, uh, these uh, oh, what do you call them? Uh, Neil Taylor used to be one over here at uh, the Church of Christ. Christ. Yeah, he was head of the, 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 the polling place. The poll watchers. He was election, no, he was election judge. Yeah, I've been an election judge. And uh, you know how it works. If that election judge is a hardcore Democrat, and he knows how to manipulate that machine and bring in truckloads of ballots, yeah. guess what? I saw it happen. You know, I mean, it's the only time I served as an election judge. And since it was my first time, I was put down counting the ballots on, on the most minor office, okay? I mean, it, was, it wasn't... Uh, Full elections and uh, oh, you told me, yeah, yeah. Got screwed. Well, one guy got screwed, yeah. I mean, what and that, that's what kind of got my suspicion because the guy that was the full head of all the election judges sat down next to me to do this constable race. Mm. You know, when, when you got the head election judge doing a constable race, I thought that odd, and then I began to notice, and I've told you the story. You know, you're just doing little one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. Only I would hear the same name called out over and over again about every third one. They give him a mark. He got all the votes. The guy he did. didn't want. Yeah, the guy they didn't want got all the votes. And I, I finally got up enough nerve and I just politely said, Excuse me, are you are you putting down all the markers? And he looked at me straight in the eye, very nice. And he says, Not everyone should win. And then he very carefully explained to me why this guy shouldn't win. And, but he explained it in such a way that I didn't really feel like asking any more questions. <laughs> you know, I mean, he didn't threaten me. Well, he did uh, in a subtle way. Yeah, very, I mean, I got the message. But if this guy had to go away. But if somebody said, did he threaten you? I, can't. I, I would say, no, there's plausible denial. He, he never threatened me. <laughs> I mean, how many, uh, who's your wife and uh, how many children do you have? That's a little different. Uh, who's, your, who's your favorite pet? All these, all, essentially what he said to me was that, that the guy that's winning, the guy that's losing, was very zealous and there were a lot of people that didn't like him. But the guy that he was running against was a mental incompetent who would be very dangerous with a weapon. And... Uh, uh, because the constable basically uh, presented warrants, okay? But it's a rural area, so if you've got a problem, you, everybody could call the constable, and he had the right to pick up a weapon and, and come over and check on things. And the guy that was winning was winning because everybody just did not like the constable. In other words, he, he was a, one of these blowhards who... And the, I got the impression the election judge didn't like him either, but but you didn't want to give this imbecile a weapon because he's dangerous. Well, I, I saw it happen I, years and years ago. We had a JC election for president. Old friend of mine, JR, JW Headstrain. He didn't like JR Patterson. JR. Oh, it was. Jim Houston, he lost the election because J.W. went in there and he counted the ballots. And there is no doubt he didn't like Houston. And he got the guy in there that he wanted because he had to, he, he was the election judge that counted the ballots. And I'm convinced that J.R. had more ballots and more, but he didn't win because J.W. J.W. didn't like him. I was very, and it happened. I saw it happen. I was very brief. President of um, Harding College's Young Republicans. Excuse me. Keep talking. Hit 48. Okay. Well, I mean, uh, I 
I think it's ready to go on four or five. Go ahead. Hang on just a moment. Well, it's a short verse. I mean, I was I was young. I was innocent, innocent, and I remember I never used that word innocent. Whereas innocent means I wasn't aware of how things were done. And so, several people convinced me uh, membership dues was a dollar, of which twenty five cents went to the state. Okay. And uh, so what we did, we got about 500 people to sign up for a quarter. In other words, we weren't interested in getting money for our, our local organization, but we were interested in getting 500 people to, to be in the club to represent us so that we'd have representation at the state. And so we had a good sizable representation because we had uh, skirted the rules. And uh, after, the, after the state meeting was over with, I realized what I'd done, and I wasn't happy about that. In other words, I realized that I'd pulled a, a typical, sneaky, corrupt political mistake because I did what other people told me to do, and they convinced me it was, it was reasonable. So I resigned. And at that point, I have had nothing to do with being in politics. I'm always a fascinated with it, but, but that was this lady that pulled up. Uh, with that, she's a Democrat. She saw what was happening in Detroit. And she finally uh, she resigned and went to uh, the Republicans. She got the word that she was not going to go on. They were telling her how to count the votes. I mean, he got it. He's got her affidavit. I don't know if they'll hold up in court. But she is a witness, and she was a Democrat, and she didn't want to do it anymore because they were trying to uh, count all these fraudulent votes. There, there are precincts in, in Detroit where Trump got zero votes in 16. Okay. And when when the when when Hillary challenged the voting in Michigan, the federal judge that was overseeing it stopped the counting. And the reason he stopped the counting was because when they got into to Detroit, it was so obviously corrupt, murky, murky, that he said, "There's no way." And and so Trump ended up carrying Detroit. Uh, I mean, carrying not Detroit, but carrying Michigan. Oh, yeah. just a handful of votes. And he ended up with like 400 more votes after the recount. But that's because the judge said it's impossible to count okay, well, what happened in, in Detroit. What's happened now is early votes uh, is what has really can come in by the tens of thousands. And because Trump was ahead in all these states, by a considerable margin in the vote. Stop the the election. Mm -hmm. it, it, it doesn't All right, it's the 2020 election story. Period. Hang on, just a moment. I'm gonna, I'm gonna need to get my dogs in the house. So I hate to ask, so getting back to that lecture real quickly, I felt blessed at the end, but did I sound yeah, okay. Yeah, you look very coherent. Okay. Uh, well, did you learn anything you didn't know the night before? Yeah, the uh about Abraham Lincoln, the uh he kind of got things set up on how they cool off moving up. Um, they had to say you're around the yeah. legality. Yeah. They, they gave serious consideration to to having several American warships sail into Liverpool 
and blow the daylights out of the layered rams in port. The one full of well. What was the British stuff out there? Big on the war. The British would have no choice. They would have had it. I mean, that's like bombing for a while. They would have had to declare war on us here. And we'd fight it out over the Caribbean and, and Canada. Okay? But, I mean, the Lincoln administration was looking at a bad situation. Go to war with England or having those weird rams destroy the Union fleet. And uh, before they had to take action, however, uh, Charles Francis Adams, uh, the full story is in late August, Charles Francis Adams uh, went to Lord Russell, who was the equivalent to uh, the Secretary of Navy, kind of what they call it in uh, England, and, uh, and said basically, uh, here's all the evidence, plain as day. And, uh, and Russell, who hated Adams, by the way, he was the, uh, he was the uh, British Minister of the Navy, uh, said, you're right. I mean, he didn't, he didn't, he didn't use, he says, you're absolutely right. I will get this taken care of. But Adams left on a short vacation. It was uh, already scheduled. And on September 5th, he came back and nothing had happened. It, you know, it's been seven days and nothing had happened. And so he just did, I mean, he, he changed from being a diplomat to a guy who's going to say it's plain as can be. But I looked for him and he stormed into Russell's office and demanded to know why nothing had happened. And Russell, you know, kind of prevaricated. And at that point, Adams made his final statement. <laughs> It is purpose for me to tell you, sir, that if those ships sail, this is war. Mm. And um, at that point, Russell went to Lord Palmerston, and Palmerston said, take care of it. <laughs> then they ran into a problem. Uh, the way you take care of it is, you say, these warships are so powerful, they have to be in the hands of the British Navy. And they were all set to do that, except the admirals of the British Navy said, no way. And the reason they said no way is that those ships were not made to the standards of the British Navy. Okay, most powerful warships in the world, but the British Navy had certain standards that they wanted in their warships and, the, and they didn't have them. They were made for the, you know, for the standards of the Confederate States of America. And so they resisted having the Laird Rams put into, uh, into the British Navy. At that point, point Palmerston had to call in the head admiral and ask him about how his family was and how much he enjoyed his job. Mm. <laughs> and all of a sudden, the British Navy said, well, you know, we could make use of them. We don't really need them, but yeah, they, they did. And one of them ended up getting shipped to the Bahamas and basically sailed the Bahama waters for uh, 30 years protecting, you know, that British colony. And the other one, uh, it became a training ship. And uh, both of them were in the British Navy for about 30 years. And then one of them sank and the other one became a party ship. Mm. Either one of them ever saw combat.
Tony Fauci and NIH have been absolutely integral to that. So uh, that's Dr. Fauci to update you on the status of vaccine development. And then uh, and then we will have General Gus Perna, who is coordinating the distribution plan for Operation Warp Speed, working with every state and territory in America to be ready on day one to distribute uh, vaccines as soon as they're available to give you a brief outline on that plan. So Dr. Fauci. Thank you very much, Mr. Vice President. Uh, as I was sitting there, I was recalling that about seven or eight months ago, I, stopped, I stood at this exact spot uh, at a time when there was really an extraordinary surge in cases in the northeastern part of the country, in New York City. And I said that if the virus was left to its own devices, it would cause a considerable degree of devastation because that's what pandemic viruses do. It's a very powerful force, and you've heard about that and what we need to do about it from Dr. Burks. However, I also said, if some of you can remember, that there's an opposing force to that, and that opposing force is us, you and I, being able to do certain things like mitigation with public health measures, again, which was just mentioned by Dr. Burks. But there's another opposing force to that, and that's a vaccine. 
And historically, if you look at highly efficacious and effective vaccines through the years, they've crushed formidable outbreaks like smallpox, like polio, like measles. So in the next couple of minutes, let me tell you about what we have now and what's going to happen in the next few months. As you well know, Operation Warp Speed has been uh, supporting directly and indirectly six candidate vaccines, four of which are either in or completed phase three clinical trial. I want to briefly tell you about two of them because you have to be interested in this. It is extraordinarily impressive. Two of the vaccines, one by Moderna and one by the company Pfizer, have completed trials and the, and the efficacious vaccine efficacy point is extraordinary. With regard to Pfizer, it was 95% efficacious, not only against disease that's just clinically recognizable disease, but severe disease. There were 10 cases of severe disease, one in the vaccine, nine in the placebo. For the Moderna trial, it was 94.5% efficacious, 11 severe events, zero in the vaccine, 11 in the placebo. For those of you not acquainted with the field of vaccinology, that is extraordinary. That is almost to the level of what we see with measles, which is 98% effective. So that's what we're dealing with. The question is, what about how that is going to be rolled out? I use the word efficacious. That means what happens in a clinical trial. The word effective means is what the ultimate impact of that vaccine is going to be on society. And the only way you can get an effective program is when people take the vaccine. And we're going to be talking to you about that. And I hear a lot now when we made these announcements this past Monday and then two Mondays ago about some reticence of people. Well, did you rush this? Was this too fast? Is it really safe? And is it really efficacious? The process of the speed did not compromise at all safety, nor did it compromise scientific integrity. It was a reflection of the extraordinary scientific advances in these types of vaccines, which allow us to do things in months that actually took years before. So I really want to settle that concern that people have about that. What about the decision of the data? Who looked at the data? Was that no, it was actually an independent body of people who have no allegiance to anyone, not to the administration, not to me, not to the companies, that looked at the data and deemed it to be sound. Now that data will be examined very carefully by the FDA, who together with a advisory committee, the Vaccine and Related Biological Products Advisory Committee, or VERPAC, are going to look at that before the FDA makes the decision about putting this forth for an emergency use authorization or ultimately for a license. So we need to put to rest any concept that this was rushed in an inappropriate way. This is really solid. Now, what does that mean for us? We now, as the vice president said, are telling you that help is on the way, which has two aspects to it. It means that we need to actually double down on the public health measures as we're waiting for that help to come, which will be soon. We'll be getting vaccine doses into people at high priority at the end of December. We're not talking about shutting down the country. We're not talking about locking down. We're talking about intensifying the simple public health measures that we all talk about. Mask wearing, staying distance, avoiding congregate settings, doing things to the extent that we can outdoors versus indoors. If we do that, we'll be able to hold things off until the vaccine comes. Now, I've used that metaphor that the cavalry is on the way. If you're fighting a battle and the cavalry is on the way, you don't stop shooting. You keep going until the cavalry gets here, and then you might even want to continue fighting. And that's the thing about it. A very impressive efficacy. 94.5 and 95% of a vaccine should motivate individuals to realize that this is something you want to participate in. So we're going to be talking.
going to you about it, why are we here in the future about why it's important as these vaccine doses roll out, why we have to do two things, continue the public health measure and get vaccinated when the vaccine becomes available. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Vice President, thank you very much for this opportunity. So I've been asked to highlight uh, our way ahead on distribution of the vaccine, uh, as just talked about by Dr. Fauci and before that, uh, Vice President Pence. You know, we are here today because our mission was clear. And our mission to Dr. Monsef Salawi, my co-leader, uh, and really heavily responsible for our success. Uh, we are here today because we focused on uh, developing, manufacturing, and distributing a safe and effective vaccine and therapeutics to the American people. Our purpose is really clear, save lives. And it has driven us to this end state, and that's why we're here today. A couple of things as we get started in our planning, uh, I will tell you that the planning began almost immediately following uh, our ceremony in Rose Garden on 15 May. That Monday, we started talking development, manufacturing, and distribution. It's not a thought that we've had in the last two weeks. It's required extensive planning and detailed work by a collaboration of individuals, which I'll talk about. A couple of things we decided up front. One, we were gonna be able to deliver the vaccine within 24 hours after EUA. That is distribution to the entire United States of America to include territories and metropolitan cities. Two, we started with a foundation of expertise. The CDC is the very best at planning and executing distribution of vaccines. We took their core competency and we aligned it with the capability of planners, uh, project managers, and those who could run campaigns. And together, this organization has come up with our strategy for distribution. Third, we took the capacity of the industry, commercial This is where we want the vaccines to be. 
We want the vaccines down at the places where the American people are comfortable, at our hospitals, our doctor's offices, down at CVS, Walgreens, down at the long uh, care uh, health care facilities, places where people are comfortable going. So that's where we started and stayed. Then we went back to Pfizer and Moderna. We laid out the guidelines that I gave you, and with the collaboration of them and the commercial industry for distribution, we came up with our plan. It's relatively simple. We take uh, the Pfizer vaccine. They are capable of distributing on their own. They will utilize FedEx and UPS in order to distribution. Simultaneously, we will ship ancillary kits needles, syringes, alcohol wipes, uh, and the dilutant required for the vaccine to meet the vaccine at the end state facilities that we're talking about. For McKessa or for Moderna vaccine, what we're going to do is we're going to meet up the vaccine with the ancillary kits at a distribution warehouse. We're going to put them together and then we're going to distribute through FedEx uh, and UPS down to our administration sites. So, in simple terms, we're taking it from pill finish, we're, cut, we're bringing together all the requirements for administering the vaccine, and then we're sending it down to the distribution sites. Any place that a state wants to administer the vaccine, as long as they're enrolled, right, into our process, we can distribute the vaccine. We can distribute the Pfizer vaccine at a minimum of 975 doses, and the Moderna vaccine at a minimum of 100 doses. We can go to one place in the state, or we can go to 10,000 places in the state. The capability and the capacity exists because we came together in a whole of America approach. It is this effort that I can look you in the face and say to you, EUA comes, 24 hours later, vaccines will be distributed out to the American people and be ready for administration. To this end, our mission is, as I stated, safe and effective vaccines to the American people, and we need to do it in the most timely manner possible, because it is all about lives. Thank you, Mr. President. I still have a hundred of you left. How many kids have already done? Uh, Mr. Vice President, we already have over a million kits of both uh, the kits that we'll need for the Pfizer vaccine as well as the Moderna vaccines. Different ones. I'm on, I'm yeah. Excuse me, one more. Thank you. So, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And as uh, he said, from the time President Trump announced Operation Wolf Speed, General Perna and his team have been working uh, literally around the clock to build the distribution plan that you see that's in effect. And I, and I hope you all heard that. I asked him uh, how many of those kits have already been manufactured for merging with um, merging with the uh, Moderna product and. Uh, They've already assembled 100 million kits uh, that are ready to go, and that's the supplies that are necessary for administering the vaccine. I, I must tell you, having received my latest briefing today over the FEMA from Operation War Speed, I think every American can be proud uh, of, uh, of the fact that we have a plan in place uh, that the moment that the FDA concludes that that vaccine is safe and effective, we have a system in place to begin within 24 hours shipping that vaccines to hospitals, healthcare facilities, and 24 hours after that, literally injecting uh, that vaccine uh, into Americans. And uh, we'll also be continuing to develop the prioritization, working with states about their plans, and maybe Bob uh, Redfield of CDC will reflect on that uh, as well in a moment. CDC will create a recommendation for priorities of who's to be uh, immunized, but uh, if history is a teacher, uh, we know that uh, we'll focus on those most vulnerable, we'll focus on our healthcare workers and, and first responders um, and at, the, uh, at the early going. But it's, uh, it's, it's truly inspiring to me to see the incredible work that Operation Warp Speed has done. And General Perna, I want to thank you for, uh, for your dedication. With that, as I said, we've continued from the very beginning to operate an approach at the federal level that is federally supported state managed locally executed and we'll continue to respect decisions that state governments are making uh, in, in efforts to slow the spread um, but uh, but to be very clear uh, 
President Trump has been very clear that we do not support another national lockdown and do not believe it is necessary. Dr. Fauci actually reflected again on we're not calling for a national lockdown, um, and we won't. But beyond that, uh, there have been some actions taken in jurisdictions around the country with regard to closing schools. Um, I want the American people to know that uh, it, is, uh, it is a position of this task force, uh, of this administration, and of the CDC that we do not need to close our schools. I want to invite Dr. Redfield to come forward to speak about that. And I want to emphasize what he's reminded our task force of many times, that actually at no point in this pandemic uh, has the CDC ever recommended closing schools. And the more we've learned about, about this virus, the more it's simply affirmed that. Uh, we think our kids belong in the classroom. We're absolutely committed to continue to provide resources. And so our kids, our teachers, our administrators can safely and uh, safely get back to school. Um, but with that, let me introduce uh, Dr. Redfield and with him, Dr. Elmore McCann's cats at HHS, who uh, uh, is an extraordinary leader. She's going to speak about the unintended consequences of, of shutting our kids out of the classroom uh, around America. And, uh, and then I'll have the secretary uh, have some closing remarks. Dr. Redfield. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. I think it's important first for me to emphasize what you've heard already is that we're not defenseless against this virus. Mask works. Social distancing works. Hand washing works. Being smart about crowds, particularly indoor, works. As, as strategic uses and Dr. Burke said of testing to identify the silent epidemic, to identify the asymptomatic infection so that they can be pulled out of the transmission cycle works. Another point that I want to make is that we need to follow the data. We should be making data-driven decisions when we talk about what we're doing for institutions or what we're doing for commercial closures. For example, as was mentioned last spring, CDC did not recommend school closures, nor did we, rec um, nor did we recommend their closures today. I will say back in the spring, there was limited data. Today, there's extensive data that we have. We've gathered over the last two to three months to confirm that K through 12 schools can operate with face-to-face -face learning and they can do it safely and they can do it responsibly. The infections that we've identified in schools, when they've been evaluated, were not acquired in schools. They were actually acquired in the community and in the household. Today, as Dr. Burke said, our big threat for transmission is not the public square. It's small family gatherings, family gatherings where people become uh, more comfortable. They remove their face mask and they get together and it's this silent epidemic that begins to transmit. But it's not inter-school transmission. The truth is for kids K through 12, one of the safest places they can be from our perspective, is to remain in school. And it's uh, really important that uh, uh, following the data, making sure we don't make emotional decisions about what to close uh, and what not to close. And I'm here to say clearly the data uh, strongly supports that K through 12 schools, as well as institutes of higher learning, really are not where we're having our challenges. And it would be counterproductive from my point of view, from a public health point of view, just in containing the epidemic, if there was an emotional response to say, let's close the schools. Uh, finally, I, you know, I wanted to echo what uh, has been said by the Vice President and Dr. Fauci, is we are seeing the light at the end of the tunnel, where we are to now. And this is why now more than ever, as was said by Dr. Burke, Dr. Fauci, myself, now more than ever, we're asking all Americans, all Americans to redouble their efforts to be vigilant, uh, to embrace mass social distancing, uh, hand washing, our advice about, about crowds, 
and really to support um, using the data to make decisions in the communities, particularly as relates to uh, K-12s and institutes of higher learning, uh, these clearly, the data support that it's really important from a public health perspective, both from the pandemic, as well as what uh, we'll, you'll hear about in a minute, that these schools stay open. Finally, I just want to end uh, on a clear message of confidence that I'm confident that we're going to emerge successful and bring this pandemic to an end. Uh, I don't have any doubt of that. Uh, but today, we need, we need all of us to go all in. We'll go all in with face coverings, social distancing, hand washing, smartness about crowds, doing our part to help identify the silent epidemic. And I have confidence that at the end of the day, we're going to get a very achievable goal, which is to get this pandemic under control. Thank you, Mr. Weston. Thank you.